Welcome to Mr. Giant Reacts and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant. And this one here, somebody suggested that uh, I watch this one here. You know, uh, it's called Irish Potato Farming, British Genocide, How They Starve Ireland. I have no clue what this is about. Uh, hit me up in the comment section. Uh, my British people at uh, Peeps and them that watch, the, watch me react. Uh, my Irish people and them who watch me react to stuff, hit me up in the bottom, tell me uh, the different perspectives. Teach our brethren, teach our brethren. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer. Many know today that Irish potato blight in 1845 was the cause of the potato disease originally from North America that affected the potato in Northern France, Netherlands and Belgium. But none of these countries were as dependent as a food source as was Ireland and when the disease reached the Irish fields, the results were devastating. One could say the millions of Irish perished due to the potato blight, but they actually starved to death due to starvation, inhumane treatment and extortion by the British. Nassau William Sr., economist to the Crown, is quoted as saying, Only one million Irish are likely to die and that will not be enough to do much good. Whoa! This is the facts of how British starved Ireland. Please subscribe and tell us in the comments below if you believe the British were responsible. The potato was not the only food source Ireland had at the time. Ireland soil was rich and fertile and ideal for livestock grazing. During the famine, an abundance of wheat, oats, barley, beef, poultry, dairy, fruit and vegetables were farmed on island soil mm. that the Irish themselves worked to produce. Only, the Irish were not allowed to consume these crops. The fields the Irish worked on was mostly owned by British landlords who sold and exported most of the crops, grain and livestock for England's consumption. The British government's indifference to the famine helped cause thousands of needless deaths. On the eve of the famine, the population in Ireland stood at about 8.5 million. The British felt Ireland was overpopulated and that it was the fault of the Irish people for being poor. The Irish were referred to as being lazy, barbaric and barely human. Two million Irish men, women and children perished by starvation and related diseases during the famine. And another two million immigrated from the island to escape poverty and starvation. British colonised Ireland and confiscated the land to raise beef cattle for the English market, forcing the Irish into deeper poverty and out to live on the land that had more rocky terrain. The estates... Okay, no, I didn't know this. This is all new to me. Like I said, hit me up in the comment section. Uh, let me know what's up. I have never known this. I think, I think sometimes... Uh, And I'm guilty of it too, and I think a lot of people are, depending where wherever you are, you get so caught up in your own people's struggles that you don't really concern yourself about others. And in a lot of countries, the history is. I don't want to say dumb dumb, but it's pretty pretty much set to your history and not too much of other people's history. Granted, on my island, we got everybody's history, but I didn't know about this year. I also saw that uh, a lot of Irish people were sent to the Caribbean as uh, slaves or indentured servants or whatever. Uh, I know there are some people of Irish descent on the island there too. Uh, let's keep watching this. Uh, this is all new to me. ...were owned by absentee English landlords that charged exorbitant amounts of rent. Rent collection was left in the hands of the landlord's agent or middlemen. This assured the landlord of a regular income and relieved them of direct responsibility while leaving the tenants open to exploitation by the middleman. Landlords lived their life in England and perhaps visited their estates once or twice a lifetime. Tenant holdings were... That kind of sounds like the uh, plantation owners on you know in the caribbean you know what i mean they lived abroad in spain or england or wherever they are and then they just visit so then especially with you know 
travel wasn't that fast so if they hear something is going wrong and they care they can't just hop and come you know the, the boat's gonna take a while to get to the island so then like they said here the middleman is doing whatever he wants and that's on the island now because uh, you know they could get to there quicker and that's crazy let's keep going so small that no crop other than potatoes would suffice to feed families. And so this is how millions of Irish became reliant on the potato. 90% of land in Ireland was owned by the British landlords. The Anglican Church was more than just a spectator to these events. The church owned 5 million acres of Irish land. In the first winter of the famine, while 400,000 Irish starved to death, the worst year of mass starvation, the amount of food that was exported out of Ireland proves there was enough food to feed the entire Irish population that was starving to death during the famine twice over. English landlords continued to export food from Ireland to England. The British government could have outlawed the export of food while people starve. However, the shipping records indicate the government allowed the landlords to export 17 million pounds sterling worth of grain, cattle, flour, eggs and poultry as well as fruits and vegetables. Food that could have fed 12 million people, twice the number of Irish tenant farmers dependent on the potatoes. The food was shipped from ports in some of the worst famine-stricken areas of Ireland and armed British regiments guarded the ports and granaries to guarantee British merchants and absentee landlords their profits. And when food prices went up, they did not increase Ireland's wages. They also imposed tariffs on food, making food more expensive to purchase. While Irish men, women and children lay dying on the streets of Ireland, the cruelty of the English continued as they passed the dead and the dying Irish with food and livestock bound for England. When in 1846, the Whigs political party came into power in Britain and put Charles Trevelyan in charge of famine relief in Ireland. Trevelyan was a big believer in the free market, where prices are determined by unrestricted competition between privately owned businesses. No government intervention in the economic system, including no legislative control over employment. Trevelyan didn't work at stopping the starvation and rather felt it was necessary, saying, quote, The famine is an effective mechanism for reducing surplus population. It is wow. the judgment of God that sent the famine to teach the Irish a lesson. He said, the real... You know, that kind of sounds familiar, you know, it's the judgment of God. That sounds kind of familiar because I remember when a hurricane hit uh, <laughs> uh, Florida, uh, some politicians were saying that's a judgment of God, you know, politicians and televangelists, that's a judgment of God because of all the homosexuals that live there. Wow. So, you see, we're repeating the same things over and over again just with different people, huh? And you can't say that it's the British people that are doing it, you know what I mean? Because I'm assuming in Britain at the time, there was people starving and having trouble there too. It's just rich people doing it. That's where we got to get the differentiation. And I'm not saying rich people are bad. There's a lot of good rich people. But the greedy ones, they'll turn us against each other while they reap the profits. They will exasperate segregation and, and uh, racism and uh, different religions and, you know, different political beliefs in order to keep their money flowing and take, you know, that's, that's it. The evil is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse and turbulent character of the Irish people. Wow. The food they offered to the starving was being limited as food must not be given to the starving to not dispose the food industry. Many say there was food being imported into Ireland to help the starving, but it was largely being used to feed the cattle that would be slaughtered to feed the British. It was not being used to feed those in need. Any temporary relief measures being given to the Irish had stipulations. The British required that food only go to the people who owned no land, forcing the impoverished people to sell any remaining land they had to their landlords. 
When other countries such as America sent food to help the hungry, they found that the British charged exorbitant cargo fees as the British wanted the food to be transferred to their ships. England profited from the Irish suffering, and in 1848, Charles Trevelyan was knighted for his work on the Irish famine relief. Landlords raised the tenants' rent so that they could evict them to use the land for farming, as it was more lucrative. When tenants could not pay for their rent, they were evicted and their homes demolished by order of Lord Palmerston, British Prime Minister. As many as 300,000 were evicted to die on the streets. Landlords were so eager to get rid of tenants that some of them offered to pay for their passage to America and Canada in exchange for their land. Many were desperate to escape in the famine. The landlords paid for the lowest class passage where it was overcrowded with sickness and disease, with poor access to food and water. 30% of passengers would perish and be buried at sea. These ships were called coffin ships, and over 2 million Irish left their beloved country, at least 600,000 never even making it across. Many Irish who were evicted and had no money to pay for their passage to America moved to impoverished areas of England to look for work. Anti-Irish prejudice was widespread. Those with Irish accents or Irish surnames were barred from getting employment and living in public houses. There were signs in the pubs and restaurants saying, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Wow. And on help wanted signs, they added, no Irish need apply. When the potato famine hit, the British government didn't try to help. Instead, the landlords saw it as an opportunity to make even more money from the land. They compared the removal of Irish in Ireland to the whites' removal of Indians in America. As the Irish died or left the country, a newspaper, the London Times, wrote, Soon a Celtic Irishman will be as rare on the banks of the Liffey as a red man on the banks of the Manhattan. Comment down below, let me know what's up. And please, no fighting and arguing and stuff, you know what I'm saying? Just talk about the stuff, you know? But, uh, and once again, you can't blame the common. Because look, they even said in there that uh, the, 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 the Irish moved to impoverished areas. No, if there's impoverished areas there, that means that the politic, the polytricksters there are terrorizing their own people there. That's why the areas are impoverished. And I guarantee you that there were politicians back then going, oh, these immigrants, these Irish, they're coming here and they're taking your jobs and they're doing all of that just so that those two would keep fighting and the money keep rolling in. Tell me if I'm wrong. Comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on this and thing. I'm going to leave a link in the description for this video. Listen, I'm going to leave it with this. A human is a human is a human. We got to stop. We got to start looking at it like that. And I mean, really mean it too. Don't just say it to, 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 to portray a certain image out there like a poly trickster would mean it we all we got man we all we got y'all take care of each other please do cool runnings